Excellent. Coming to you live from uh, sunny, warm New Hampshire this uh, November evening, it's Eric Ruthenberg, uh, District Vice President of Course Director Development, here to uh, share some knowledge uh, with my friend Donnie and uh, hopefully uh, help out directors across the land in, the, in our barbershop hobby. Welcome. Thanks for your time today, everyone. Glad you could be here. Um, let's get to our next slide right off the bat and share some news. First of all, I want to share with everybody that Leadership Academy is coming up soon. It's no longer in January. It's in December this year. We decided to move that up uh, to uh, December because of uh, some weather reasons last year, especially, um, and some, some other logistical things. So we, we moved it up to December this year. So we got to uh, register. I have, uh, I have a handful of you registered for the director's class, which is great. It's going to be December 1, 2, 3, uh, the, the, most of it being on the 2nd, Saturday the 2nd, in uh, sunny Hyannis, Massachusetts, down on Old Cape Cod, as it were. And our clinician is going to be Dr. Chris Peterson, local boy made good, out with a little chorus called the Masters of Harmony. Uh, is going to be joining us as the clinician this year all day. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait to have Chris back here in the NED uh, sharing his his knowledge with us again. Um, if you would like to go and uh, find out more details, uh, anydistrict.org slash leadership is where it's all at. Please go register. Okay, we'll see you there. It's going to be great. Um, the archive of all these webinars is always available online. You can see every single one of them at uh, anydistrict.org slash directors. So you can go catch up on the old ones. Had a lot of great uh, folks here and a lot of great uh, ideas and knowledge to be shared. So go ahead and dig into that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago at the district convention, I had a few people come up to me and say, hey, my course is looking for a director. Can you help me out? Well, I, uh, here we go. Norwich, Connecticut and Beverly, Massachusetts are both in need of directors. If you should know anyone in the area who's interested in maybe getting into that, uh, reach out to me or go ahead and reach out to those guys directly uh, or shoot me an email. We'll get you in touch with them. Uh, certainly want to get a good director out in front of those choruses so they can be successful. Speaking of which, we were up in Waterville, Maine recently, uh, uh, last week, I think it was, uh, and had a great time up in Waterville with some uh, gentlemen from some s several chapters around the area, Bangor and Waterville and, uh, and, uh, and uh, mainly music chorus, uh, had a great old time. Uh, outstanding in front, if you don't know, is for potential directors who possibly have never waved their hands before, uh, looking to get some conducting experience and learn about conducting, learn about teaching, rehearsing, uh, leadership, things like that. So we had a grand old time up there. Uh, and my friend Dan Falcone, segue to the, my next bullet point, was up there too. And we had a great time you know, sort of co-teaching for the day. Uh, and Dan will be next year's NED DVP of CDD do da do da right uh so dan welcome we're glad to have you with us online today too um and we're glad uh, that you're going to be uh taking the reins here from me i've had a great time doing this job and i will be uh, certainly happy to continue doing the webinars people seem to enjoy them and keep tuning in for some reason so thank you dan so i just want to give a shout out to some of our uh, our Chorus results from the district contest. Our district chorus champs uh, under the direction of Joey Constantine conquered Massachusetts. Our international chorus representatives from Portland, Jay Wiley, and most improved chorus in the district, our hosts chapter was very cool. Sebi Massa, congratulations. Way to go, guys. All your hard work and all the competitors across the stage in uh, beautiful downtown uh, Manchester, Connecticut. Had a great time. Tonight's guest, drum roll is our friend Donnie Rose, who's been uh, director of Harmony University for uh, how many years now, Donnie, you've been doing this? Uh, going on four years now. Excellent, excellent. So while I, uh, while I hand you the reins so you can share your screen and, uh, sh and, and pour some knowledge into all of us, I want to I ask you, I went to Harmony College back in the day when I first joined this wonderful hobby, which was 1994, I guess, uh, and it was at St. Joe, and it's been a while. So uh, as a segue into your uh, portion here, can you tell us how the week is different now from back in the day when it was at St. Joe? Uh, and let's start with that. I'll make you presenter. Well, sure. Well, first of all, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for giving up a, 
a night of Patriots football and domination <laughs> to hang out and talk about <laughs> barbershop. That's pretty cool. Uh, uh, Eric asked the question uh, about, uh, let's see, show my screen. Am I showing, Eric? I don't see it yet, but I will be soon. Show my screen here. There you go. Great. So uh, I'll, I'll be kind of showing a variety of pages that might be of use to all the, the folks on the, on the line. But uh, so kind of Eric asked, like, what's the difference with uh, Harmony College back in the day at St. Joe and Harmony U now in Belmont? Um, uh, I think we have a lot of the same roots. We have uh, a week-long school, which is pretty rare. Most of them now are kind of long weekends or just kind of weekend things. Um, it's uh, a true week from a Sunday to Sunday, which is wonderful and horrifying at the same time because it makes it difficult for people if they attend an international convention or a midwinter convention or even our district convention to uh, give up that much time. But we've stayed with that because it's totally an immersive experience. So some of the ways it's the same, it's hanging out with your barbershop friends, eating ice cream, singing tags and having all that fun and with some of the best faculty in the United States, well, frankly, in the world. One of the ways it's different now is um, back when Eric did it in the 90s and back when I was even started on faculty and uh, started teaching and, and even when I was a student there in the 80s, um, we we kind of treated it like the military where we said, so Eric, you are a, this is your first year attending and you uh, are a director. So we're going to decide all the things you're taking. Thank you very much. And then you were assigned and did things, but because you're an adult, you said, screw this. And you skipped the ones you didn't want to go to. And you, and so all our, our classes were uh, uh, prescriptive. And so some, if, if a person wasn't particularly good, their class would have two people and some, like we had a Dr. Chris Peterson, his class had like 90 people. So uh, there was a, a whole bunch of flux in the schedule. And so we figured, you know, we should probably just be like most adult education systems where we just let people decide. So we opened up a lot of classes. We let you decide if you want to take theory four and didn't make you test in. And if you're to say, hey, I'm going to take uh, advanced arranging will will let you sign up and will also make it easier for you to change your mind later. So the schedule is open for you to take a lot more. Um, it's also, uh, it's actually a shorter day. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Eric, you started at like eight or nine in the morning and you went to eight or nine or 10 at night. Do you remember yeah, that? I do. Yeah, that is probably the absolute worst thing that we know in adult <laughs> education to do. Um, <laughs> is to do the cram uh, type of education, which we do, which a lot of places do that. You know, they just say, you know, we got to get our money's work. So when when I or my friends or maybe you guys go to these education workshops, they start at eight and go to 10. And if you remember from your cramming in college and high school days, uh, it doesn't retain as well. And it also means that typically if it's a repeating thing like Harmony U, that by Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, you know, we had breakdowns or people just kind of stopped attending a whole bunch of their classes. So we just compressed the day and made it a lot uh, shorter. So we have uh, classes that are required, but then we have a lot more electives. So you can choose to go to the bar or sleep in or do whatever, but there's a lot more flexibility in the day. So if you want to, you can take something from eight in the morning till nine at night but if, if but the things you sign up for are much more uh finite so we have basically four or six hours of uh weekly instru uh, daily instruction and then we have some electives on top of it so it's just a lot more uh ease in the schedule which means that directors and coaches and faculty can sit together in the cafeteria and have a much more leisurely pace hang out and just have a lot more flex time so that they're not just completely dead. Um, I remembered we had an expression on faculty that everybody cries on Thursday because uh, by that time of the week, everybody was so tired, uh, but they didn't want to miss anything that uh, people were having basically breakdowns because they were just so exhausted. So that's one of the first thing I changed. And plus uh, probably the most noticeable change about HU now is uh, we, when I showed up, we, we were using the same wonderful uh, 30 or 40 people over and over again. And heck, I was one of them. And I was really honored 
to be one of those people that they kept using. But that also meant that we were missing really great people that might be able to offer something that maybe just needed a chance to get their foot in the door. So uh, I opened, a, I made it open enrollment, kind of like if you look for a job now, you can look for a job on the faculty at Harmony U. And uh, so that's been really fun to see lots of growing new people uh, and then resting completely competent, great people. So like Chris Peterson, you know, I'd love to have him more, but he comes once every two or three years and that's just fine. Uh, great people like Tom Gentry will be rested. Great people like me will be rested because we don't want to uh, have our students that come year after year see the same group of, you know, 40 or 50 faculty members. So that's probably one of the most noticeable differences that Eric would notice from the 90s. And then finally, uh, it's, if you haven't been to HU Belmont, uh, Belmont is a glorious <laughs> uh, private uh, school in uh, Nashville that looks like it's uh, out of Gone with the Wind and the Plantations of Terra. It is <laughs> it really does. so beautiful. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. And uh, the, the campus is much closer than St. Joe's. And with a loving heart, you know, the people in Missouri Western are great, but the facilities weren't really uh, spectacular. They were actually kind of a little beat up and the buildings weren't pr particularly great. And I don't know, Eric, if you remembered that the faculty at HU, we always sat on the stage. Yeah. The reason why we did that is the there wasn't enough room for everybody in that, uh, <laughs> that hall. There you go. So uh, it only held, I think, 350 or something like that. I can't remember. And so we proudly said, it's a sellout, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's dinky. <laughs> so now we're, we're about double that size at Belmont and we have room to grow. So we have five courses coming this year. We're up to about 13, 14 quartets. We'll probably cap it at about 20 quartets. Last year I had students from 16 countries. I already have a student from uh, our quartet from, and I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, United Ar Aramitis, whatever, right next to uh, Saudi Arabia. Right. Where... Uh, Dubai is, mm -hmm. uh, so it's a group of nine guys that are in a barbershop group from there, and a quartet from Italy and a quartet from Belgium. So it truly is a world-class uh, uh, school with people from all over the world on faculty. And uh, and the last thing to say, if you haven't been about HU, then we'll kind of talk about tonight is, um, a man, the thing that I love about HU that's so different than a, a convention is, when I go to international or midwinter or even a district, uh, so much of our time is like cloistered away from each other because we're getting ready for a contest. And then when the contest hit, everybody has a party, then they all leave. Well, HU never has that contest. So we're just hanging out at the bar after uh, class. We're hanging out in the cafeteria, talking to each other. It'd be kind of like seeing uh, Bill Belichick and Pete Carroll sitting together, uh, sharing their top secrets with each other because they're, they would like their opposing group to do better so that the opposing group can beat them in the next contest. <laughs> so that's the, the mindset of like uh, all these great directors and leaders and uh, uh, musicians in our organization trying to help each other. And it's freaking cool. Yeah. So watching, you know, my buddy Aaron Dale working with, uh, with a group that's going to a contest at, uh, with Theo Hicks, it's in the same district and they're trying to make each other's groups better to push each other. And it's just uh it's, it's really, really cool. So if you haven't been, um, I give scholarships to directors who have never, Sebi is one of them. Uh, if you're a director and you've never been, um, I'll cover your 750 bucks, it's my treat. First time, ne never been, and you're a frontline director, uh, I'll cover it until the money runs out. Cool. So I've got about 80 grand to do on that, and that's all from, the generous folks at Harmony Foundation, which are it's really, the, of course, the generous folks like you and me who are donors that help that happen. So it's pretty cool. Awesome. So those are some of the differences about HU. And uh, uh, but uh, mostly today, I wanted to uh, talk kind of briefly about some of the resources we have as uh, barbershop directors. Now, before everybody else heard, got on, I heard from Chad who shared he was an assistant director. And then I had to let my cat out. So can you guys just give me a quick 20, 30 seconds, so I know uh, what where everybody is coming from and kind of what their deal is. Uh, yeah, let me go uh, down the list here. I'll go in order. So, Chad, we we've heard from you. Dan, t Dan Falcone, tell us where you are and where you're. What's your story? Uh, 
Hi, I am a frontline director in Hanover, New Hampshire, and uh, we've got about 30 guys. And our chorus scores in the low 60s. I'd love to improve that. And I have gone to Harmony University a number of times, two, three times for directors and two times for quartet. Cool. Lovely. Uh, Jay Wiley joining us from Portland, Maine. Jay, how are you? Come in, Jay. There he is. Did I lose you, Jay? I cannot hear you, Jay. Uh, Richard. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, Richard. Tell us what, where you're directing. I am directing a, a chorus in uh, Cornwall, Ontario, which is about two hours away from Montreal, between Montreal and Toronto. It, there's about 10 guys that are rather getting old, like me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my main goal is to try to, um, right now, make better music so we can attract more people. I'd like to expand that chorus. And my dream is to bring them to competition next spring, if possible. But my main challenge is to try to find a way to bring more people. It's kind of it's kind of spiraling down right now yep. a bit. We just have this uh, static group of guys who right. get, gather fairly regularly every week. And sometimes I'm missing my tenor section, which is which is one tenor. Right. <laughs> I have to sing as I direct, which mm -hmm. I, I don't like. I have to do it because, you know, feel like I, I need to do that. And I, I, I need more, more members. But we tried last uh, April to do a big uh, gathering with uh, the Ottawa Chorus, who uh, kindly came and, and reinforced our group for one night. We were about 110, finally. And, I didn't get anything from that except a nice reunion of barbershopper singing together. It's like an interchapter night, but uh, I still feel like I need to do something else to bring some people from out of the barbershop ranks. You know, like somebody that would like to join that kind of singing and mm -hmm. and come sing with us. Good. That's my problem right now. Good. Well, I'm sure you are not alone in that in that uh, boat, Richard, and I uh, hope tonight is helpful for you. Uh, this just in from Jay up in Portland, Maine. His mic is not working, but he is here and listening diligently. Uh, and do I see, do my eyes deceive me, or is Russell Sketchley out there? As a matter of fact, I did make it. Yes, 100% Eric, how you doing? to the webinars, Russell Sketchley. <laughs> hey, Russell, well, Russell, Russell, how are you? Hi, Richard. How are you? Very good, very good. I was in Halifax last weekend. Oh, were you really? You should have yeah. gone. Yeah, I thought I would see you there. <laughs> the Harmony, Russell, Harmony Inc. Oh, the Harmony, Harmony Inc. stuff, yeah. Yeah. Harmony Inc. had their international competition in Halifax last weekend. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, I didn't get to any of it, but uh, our girls did well, so we were happy about that. Cool. Yeah, Russell, you did. Russell, update yeah, so us I just, where you direct just, and what your, what your story is. Okay, I, I actually just managed to sign in in the last few minutes here, but uh, uh, I direct in Halifax, the Halifax Harmonizers. Um, we are two choruses that combined. We were two small choruses in Halifax and the Bedford Sackle area, uh, which are very close together. And so uh, we combined into one chorus of around 30 to 35 active members. Uh, there's another chorus in our area. Um, who rehearse less than a 10 minute walk away from where we rehearse. Uh, they're about the same size, they're a little bit bigger than we are, but not a lot. Uh, anyway, um, things are going reasonably well. They're, uh, we've, um, uh, our, I think our singing is improving a lot in the last little while. We just put on a couple different, um, small performances in the last two weeks that went very very well and i was quite i i co-direct by the way the, another director that's that takes part with me and uh, we were both saying that the last two performances the guys are singing well 
our big annual show is coming up in a couple of weeks on the 25th. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, that's where we are. We're working on improving our singing and uh, somewhat working on performing, uh, on improving <laughs> our performance as well. Um, you can only get so much out of some people, but they're trying. I will, I will definitely give them that. They are good. absolutely, definitely trying. Which good. Is good. Good. Well, Russell, we're glad you're here. You'll get the attendance award in the mail. <laughs> Same one I got last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Over to you, Donnie. Fantastic. Well, it's I. I think I know uh, everybody except uh, Chad. I, I don't believe we've met. Does that sound right? Um, we may have met briefly at a Ned thing last year, possibly, but I'm okay. not sure. Okay. Cool. Well, guys, it's it's great to have you on the line, and I, I I just wanted to talk kind of briefly about some of our resources that we have for directors and uh, opportunities, and then kind of uh, talk about your uh, you know things that might be applicable to you. My background is um, I'm a I'm a retired music teacher, and because of my proximity of uh, my high school, I was close to about four colleges. Uh, I was blessed to have 17 student teachers and uh, having lots of student teachers, uh, uh, people that are unaware of the education field, they, they go, oh, so you basically got a semester off. And actually, when you have a student teacher, you actually give yourself more work. Uh, but it's, it's really gratifying to work with somebody and help them in their directing and rehearsal journey. And that's kind of how... Um, I got involved in working for the society because it's just kind of the same thing, but just a slightly different uh, organizational structure than a public school. It's all these little barbershop chapters all over the world. So uh, we'll talk about some strategies, particularly about, uh, Richard, you're concerned about uh, the guys spiraling smaller and uh, uh, you got to sing to help it hold it together and all that stuff. I think uh, everybody in this room knows what you're talking about. I remember at one of my schools, uh, my one snare drummer didn't show up for the field show, so I put on a frickin' snare drum and went out and took the spot. <laughs> I was so mad, but it was just the reality of uh, the scene. So, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you do what you feel like you gotta do to, to help the entire group work. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So for, for starters, um, I hope you will all consider joining uh, the Facebook group, uh, Barbershop Course Directors, that I have up, um, where we talk about quite a bit of, uh, uh, you name it, it's it's all, <laughs> it's all fair game. Uh, one of the things that's particularly cool is it's a nice group. Uh, it's not like the, the typical barbershop group that has lots of uh, uh, kind of snarky stuff and uh, fantastic discussions uh, talking about rehearsal strategies, talking about uh, uh, what, how do you audition, just you name it, and it's all out there, and it's great, and the people are really nice, and because um, I'm one of the administrators, uh, I, I administer it pretty tight, so it's uh, it's friendly. So uh, request to join that if you haven't, and I, uh, I think you'll, you'll find that very helpful. Um, if you haven't gone onto the Society page, we have a 99-page, uh, downloadable for free uh, uh, directing a barbershop course. Um, it's, we're actually uh, updating it right now with Steve Scott and Antonio and I, but it has um, so much fantastic uh, literature about probably more of the why, like why am I directing? Why am I, uh, why am I in this spot and how can I grow? Because as you know, for many directors, uh, the reason why they're directing is they felt like if I don't do this, my chorus is going to die. And so they, they uh, take on directing out of a uh, sense of a need or uh, they feel like if they don't do it, uh, nobody else will. So uh, take a look at that because it really has some fantastic materials. And that's for free on the Barbershop Harmony Society. Then, of course, there's my actual Harmony University page. So this is, uh, if you go to the top of the, the uh, societybarbershop.org, 
and then go on the education link and slide down to Harmony University online. Um, there's all this wonderful s stuff that we have. So we obviously give private lessons online in voice and coaching, but we also have all these free available videos um, with more coming out all the time. Uh, Copyright 101, we just released, we haven't put it up yet. Structuring Effective Course Rehearsal with Theo. He talks about actually planning like by the minute how to put together a rehearsal. And, and if you're like me, uh, you've had rehearsals that you planned and go terribly, and you have rehearsals that you haven't really planned that were brilliant, and you've had it every possible combination. And so much of what we know about rehearsal planning is um, kind of learning what works with your people and obviously the most uh, talked about one is down below here, which <laughs> Don Campbell and, and uh, Kirk Young put together, which is my favorite title, Directors Stop Talking. And so Don Campbell in this online video uh, works with a course that has never rehearsed and basically does a wordless, speechless uh, rehearsal of a song. And then Kirk gets up two or three times and kind of translates what's happening, uh, what Dr. Campbell is doing. And the, just the whole idea of you can communicate more than you think with gesture. And if you're like me, sometimes you get in a rehearsal and it looks like, oh, my gosh, the director keeps talking and won't shut up and let you uh, get to the to the singing. Um, two others of note, uh, Power of Positive Coaching, Cindy Hansen and Paul Ellinger just do a really nice job taking – uh, two uh, thrown together quartets. Uh, one is pretty good, the young guys quartet with some guys from your area. And then the other, some older people that are kind of struggling, but um, it's fantastic how Paul and Cindy work with them. And that really applies to what we do as directors. Uh, it's so easy to get in this stuff, the trap of you're rehearsing a group and then you stop. And the first thing out of your mouth is the one or two or 20 things that are wrong. And we never really take the time to say the first thing out of our mouth, well, wasn't that lovely? Or tenors, that was glorious. And, and so Paul and Cindy are just uh, real masters of uh, uh, giving you some specific techniques. Uh, Directors Roundtable talks about a lot of the uh, issues that all directors have. That's with Rob Mance, uh, Gary Steinkamp, and Steve Armstrong. And while they may direct, uh, two of those gentlemen direct, uh, you know, a medalist chorus. Gary uh, is a uh, director of a, of a chorus now that's scoring, you know, 78 or 80, but they weren't scoring that high very long ago. And he's been in barbershop his whole life and just has a lot of interesting points of view for directors to think about. So anyway, all kinds of stuff for you to look at and Harmony University Online. And then uh, two more. Um, there are so many of these types of groups. This is Total Choir Resources, but uh, Chorus America and other groups have these kinds of uh, uh, bullet point uh, rehearsal tips. Uh, and the thing I like about this is these are geared for adult education. Typically, it's like a church choir, but uh, obviously, barbershop choirs are very much the same. And so this is geared for uh, people who are maybe not professional musicians, but are trying to put together a great rehearsal uh, and they know what doesn't work but they don't always know what works and so these five are great and these are the this is the type of stuff that I would do with my student teachers where you go through and like what do I need to accomplish uh, what would I like to accomplish which is very different because you know sometimes I want to get lost in you know working a phrase and I realize oh my gosh my kids have to do the national anthem tomorrow we just have to we have to spend time and get to, because we're going to perform it. And so sometimes it's just a reality. Uh, number three, start with singing, not talking. Um, I am shocked when I visit uh, choruses or, pardon me, chapters, and they have uh, rehearsal nights that begin with all kinds of talking. Uh, and they talk about how we're going to sing, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk. I would suggest that you uh, break, the, uh, <laughs> break the insanity and just have some sort of way that the people are instantly singing, and then you could do some type of warm-ups. But I wouldn't do uh, blow a B-flat and sing crappily on two or three songs. I would instead do something where you're using their mind, you're doing some type of, 
uh, type of a warm up that's a little more like they don't really know what's going to happen. You crazy guy, what's going to happen tonight? But it's singing, it's not talking. Um, I'll, I'll let you read number four, the sacrificial section. It's it's pretty fun because uh, what will happen is you'll be in a rehearsal and things go poorly. And I've seen this where directors lose their mind and they have a tantrum, and they storm out about something. It, it's just there are times that you can't do the thing you want to do because as Richard shared, maybe it's the night that the tenor didn't show up. And so you're going to work on a tenor feature and it doesn't feel like you can do it without the, the melody, whatever. You sometimes just have to pull the ripcord and let that section go in your rehearsal and just move on because it it you can plan it, but it just doesn't work. And I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about, particularly if you've ever stood on the risers. But I've been in that situation too. It's a director where it's like, man, I don't want to let that go. Um, and if you forget everything I say tonight, please remember number five, finish on the high. Even in your rehearsal early, if you're having a sing through, you had a ring and tag, everybody's pumped. It's 10 minutes before you normally stop and you're feeling like you're kind of near the end. It's like, uh, um, thanks everybody, good night. You know, and just out the door so that we can have this big, uh, happy experience on the end. So I like to think of rehearsals like an hourglass where at the beginning, we're covering lots of just kind of basic subjects in our warmups. It's very broad. And then in the middle of the rehearsal is the smallest part of the hourglass where we're getting picky and we're maybe rehearsing something and maybe we're stopping and maybe we're duetting and trioing and we're getting kind of fussy. But we don't do that the whole night because the guys will just get get bored. And then we go back wide and we and we sing larger sections of songs. And then we might even do the unthinkable. We might actually perform two songs in a row without talking about it. Because sometimes having uh, those uh, longer experiences are what the guys need. Now, maybe if that's all they do, that isn't what they need. And, and you guys are able to uh, kind of pick that up. So anyway, this is a wonderful resource, this uh, uh, Total Choir resource. Uh, there's another resource uh, put out by Chorus America, uh, which is a great, uh, great organization that Barbershop partners with. And I've been to many of their conferences and um, actually their conference in Providence. And uh, mm -hmm. that fantastic stuff about directing a choir. And then like the last one I pulled up is um, you can find all kinds of Barbershop podcasts to kind of get inspired. So this particular one, uh, Gold Medal Moments with Toby Shaver is great because it's it's much more deep dive. It's not at all about uh, singing per se with recordings. It's much more about uh, barbershoppers' journeys and what they did and how they got there uh, and just lots of fantastic uh, content and conversation. And uh, it's really fun. And um, I was I had a blast doing one myself. And uh, check it out because uh, Toby does a really nice job interviewing people and talking about uh, their journey. And a lot of those people are uh, directors but a lot of them are not. So I think you might uh, get a kick out of downloading Gold Medal Moments uh, to your phone and have that uh, as something you can enjoy to listen to. So um, I wrote down uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, you all talked about in your area. Um, Chad talked about uh, being a, kind of an assistant and trying to get going in, in this. Uh, Dan, uh, frontline guy, he's got his 30 guys, but they're kind of singing in the low 60s and they, you know, it's, he really wants to get uh, get better. Jay, I know that your mic is not working, but you're very invested. Uh, I've sung many, many tags with Richard and, and are familiar with him and uh, know that he's a fantastic singer and a great uh, uh, musical mind and wants to get his group singing better, but he's been plopped in a place where it can be tough. Um, and then, of course, Russell, uh, I'm so glad to see you working with the guys in Halifax there. And uh, uh, that's that's really, really exciting. Russell does something I'd like you to all consider, if at all possible. He mentioned that he's a co-director. And um, I think one of the hardest things to direct a small chorus is to kind of be the only person that's out front. And uh, uh, one of our uh, HU uh, how-to articles that's coming out fairly soon is kind of talking about the power of uh, collaboration and having a variety of people. Um, one of the things we know about adults is if they hear the same voice, and I think I am a pretty compelling person in front of a large group, 
but I know that they really kind of zone out after about 15 minutes. Uh, no matter how great I am, um, I have uh, stood on the risers and sung for Jim Henry, and about 15 minutes, I start to glaze over and go, man, Jim Henry, shut up. And uh, and then David Wright gets up there in about 15 minutes, like, man, David, put... it's not the people. They're incredibly talented. It's that we need to change the environment somehow. So as directors, what I'd like you to first consider is having just you be the person that's out front is probably going to be a, a problem. So make sure that you grow people that maybe only come out for like five minutes. And maybe all they do is stand behind you and say, oh, that sounded better or that didn't sound as, as good. And just find new ways to get other people in front. Because what happens is I know as a chorus singer, I sing uh, one way when it's just my director, but I sing very differently if two or three people are standing out in front and watching us. So for uh, the last year or so, um, I've been uh, singing with Kentucky Vocal Union and, and doing a lot of uh, uh, coaching for KVU with Aaron Dale. And, you know, the guys sing pretty well, but when I stand on the left and uh, – Chad St. Wolf's or uh, 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 Chad, um, oh, I've lost his name, uh, 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 stands on the right side. Uh, it's, it's amazing how uh, the entire chorus gets very different because I know uh, people are watching them and listening to them. And all of a sudden the chorus gets better because different people are saying in front. We haven't said anything, but it's just the idea, Chad St. John, it's just because they're uh, uh, having these people watch them and see them. So consider growing people, even if they're not as good as you, because those people need a chance to get out in front. And sometimes it can be something as simple as, you know, something happened uh, on the second page uh, right here, uh, right here, uh, Russell, I don't know exactly what, but it didn't sound as good, like, oh, great, you know, and, and that kind of uh, involvement really uh, empowers the group. Uh, secondly, um, small groups require, please, please, small groups require something where they feel like they're good. Um, I know as a director of, uh, of a pretty large group in the uh, Seattle area, um, before I went to that large uh, chorus in Bellevue, um, I kind of started in a very small, kind of aging, struggling chorus, uh, which is now kind of doing better the last year or two, but it was near kind of death. And after a while, you just kind of get disheartened and it's like, well, it's going to suck. Here I go. I guess I'm just going to try to try to make it. And you know what? Those little choruses need those gold medal moments, too. And so what I found is that if I could use a tag or a small section of a song and let them sing it really well and let them sing it really well more than once, um, they kind of got excited and fed. But the most common mistake directors make, and it's the mistake every young music teacher makes, and it's a mistake every barbershop chorus director when they start makes is they program music that is too hard for their singers at the beginning. And so if you're excited uh, and you're cooking uh, and you go, you know, I'm got, we got to do a vocal spectrums new uh, chart uh, with my chorus that's singing in the low 60s or high 50s, um, I would suggest to you that the experience that those people have will be uh, uh, not as strong of experience as if you pick something much easier so that they could sing really, really well and then build on that. And every once in a while, old barber shoppers say, oh, the guys are inspired by that. And I'll tell you, that's bull crap. The guys are inspired by beautiful singing. And you can have a variety of charts. Like, this is the chart that is going to be our aspirational goal chart. So it's going to be Aaron Dale's new monster chart that is really, really tough. That's great. But don't only sing Aaron Dale monster charts. Make sure you sing some nice, easy, in the middle of the umbrella Tom Gentry charts that they could sing when with half of them are sick so that they feel like, yeah, we're singing pretty good so that there's this variety of levels of difficulty so that these small choruses feel good because there'll be a time when you realize, hey, we can't maybe do this chart tonight, 
but we're going to do it next night. Um, the other piece for, uh, uh, I think this might be mostly for Richard, but it might be for others too. Um, why do you suppose, and this isn't a question for Richard, but I'll ask it to everybody. Why do you suppose we ask directors to not sing along with the chorus? It changes how you listen. Say more. Sure. So um, <laughs> I found that when I try to do that, my gesture suffers, my ability to perceive what's actually happening in the chorus suffers, and my singing suffers too. <laughs> you can't do both things at, at your very best at the same time. So either be a singer or be a director, but don't try and be both. Totally agree. Yeah. Now, now Richard, I, I will be the first to say, and brother, everybody on this call knows your pain and nobody's oh. judging that oh yeah we man <laughs> we get it everybody gets it so there's no there's no judgment there's only like a, a, a an aspirational hope for you which is like you know what you could even tell the guys you know what guys i'm gonna do a little experiment tonight uh i'm going to uh not sing on this song even when you're struggling and uh I'm just, we, let's just see what happens. And if it falls apart, it falls apart. Uh, but I think what you'll discover is uh, the guys, unbeknownst to you, totally lean on that, uh, and it, or, or maybe they don't. But I think that uh, if you constantly sing with them, it just kind of trains them that you'll give it to them. I've also seen directors where as they're directing a song, uh, if a section is uh, too slow, they clap to make them go faster, or they do all these other things. And all these are a little bit, uh, 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 they actually can be kind of damaging. So consider uh, letting everybody know like, hey, we're gonna do a little experiment tonight. I just wanna really let you uh, sing, and then I'm gonna sing along on the next song, just so that they can get in the habit of not having you sing. And then what you'll notice, and I, I know you know this, but uh, it, you can't hear as well when you you're singing because uh, you know your your voice is going to be drowning out the voices of the others. So it's just about kind of picking it up that uh, uh, it's it's just a little part of the journey. That kind of also goes with uh, small choruses. Um, Chad, uh, as an assistant and as a person trying to get in, it is likely that you're going to have the hardest one of all, which I bet Dan, Jay, Richard, and Russell have all experienced, and probably Eric. I know I did. If you start in the chorus and then work your way up in time and then say, and now you're the guy that's been in the chorus, but now you're in front of the guys, um, it can be kind of hard for the guys to accept you and move from, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're a director now? And so it feels kind of weird. Um, and so there has to be uh, something that you do that separates you uh, and gives them the confidence to follow you. And believe it or not, it's preparation. It's like if, if you are so prepared uh, that you've really got your uh, directing together and your understanding of the music together, uh, it's, it's, they'll, they'll totally be with you, even though you're one of them. So, Chad, for example, if you come out, um, it would not be fair of the frontline director to, to spring it on you. But if you knew, like, okay, next week I'm doing the warm-up and I'm doing 15 minutes on What a Wonderful World. So, okay, and so if you want have your stuff together, it's written down, and you know what you want to do, and then <laughs> most importantly, everybody on this call, please, please know everybody's part in your brain. So know the baritone, know the lead, know the tenor, know the bass, know where they're going to have a trouble. So my favorite way to demonstrate this is I do a thing called the all chapter chorus. And last year we had about, gosh, 150 guys at mid midwinter, and it's been really, really fun. But we talk about uh, how we all sing the song, uh, Keep the Whole World Singing. And I usually make a $50 bet with the bass section. And I say, basses, I'll give you each 50 bucks if you can sing, keep a melody ringing and ringing. And I'll give you 50 bucks each. And they all laugh and grumble and say, I've been singing that for 30 years. I've been singing that for 40 years. I've been singing for 50 years. Great. Here's 50 bucks. Here's an here's a, here's E flat. Ready? Go. Keep a cluster. 
And because what they've learned is they don't know those notes. But after a while, it just starts to sound fine because like a smelly house, when you visit a person with a smelly house, you instantly notice that strange odor, but the people living in the house don't notice it because they become immune to it. They don't notice it anymore. So it is for directors. We have to be fierce about our knowledge of the notes on the page because um, it's bizarre, guys. Uh, we give tours every day at the society, probably anywhere from two to four a day. And when they get to the third floor, <laughs> good Eric. <laughs> and at the on the third floor, every single barbershopper wants to sing uh, with the guys, which is we love. They're our members, and that's really cool. So uh, usually we sing a polecat. Um, in my almost four years now of working for the society, I have had hundreds of men I, and women I've sung with, and I would guess probably three to five percent of them actually know the notes and words part of my heart or uh my wild air shrills or whatever because and they always mess up on you know three or four or five or ten notes but they get most of it right because most of these gentlemen are wonderful older chorus singers and they've learned that it's really okay to sing a large number of wrong notes because it, it's not really a big deal. And so as a director, I will tell you that your acceptance of quality is what determines the growth of the group. Now, so like Richard's like saying, man, these guys are spiraling, I'm, I'm afraid. It's like, so you're not gonna come in like a bull in a china shop and beat these guys up, but you are going to have them try some new music. And then when they learn the new music, you can build it slowly and craft it beautifully and let the old stuff be what it is. And it's going to always have all those troubles because that stuff that we learn and ingrain the wrong notes, it's so hard to undo it. So just love them, forgive them, get rid of that music and bring in new music over time so that they can have some success on, on new charts with uh, actually learning the right notes. Um, as far as like guys that are in the low, what's up? Hey, I wonder, um, so I'm in a position where I'm, I'm hoping that we can turn over music um, in our show stuff that's been around for a long time. Um, what kinds of recommendations do you have for like how to turn over show rap and how to pace that? Right. So all of us have been in this situation and I, I had the deal of having a, a, a elderly choir, an elderly barbershop chorus in the Tacoma area, actually the, the chapter that made the most happy fellows. And uh, uh, they had been singing uh, a couple of their songs in the mid 80s uh, for 20 years then. And I think some of the songs they're still singing now. And uh, uh, it's really hard to get rid of music. So usually what, what we would do is we would talk about, all right, so if we have like say a nine song set for a show, uh, uh, let's try to have, uh, three songs that are our oldies, goodies, and we love them, and then we've kept them. Uh, three songs that we've had for like a year or two, and three songs that are, are brand new for our show so that our audience isn't like bored of hearing the same music. Uh, and usually most people could get behind like, we've got my comfortable old charts, we have our songs that have been around a little while, and we've got our brand new charts that we're gonna share with people. That seemed to work for, uh, my my uh, my older group, uh, uh, Joe Cerruti and the Harmonizers, uh, they were doing something like that. But people are saying, yeah, we really don't want to go to the show because you sing so much of your old music. It it's not really a a new show. It's the same charts over and over. So the Harmonizers took a hard stance and they said, you're right. Nobody else does this. So for their shows, it's all new music for the chorus. That's what they've decided to do. And, and and I'm actually starting a mixed course here, a mixed barbershop course in the Nashville area. That And that's what we're gonna do too. So everything turns over because it's boring for the audience. Now, you can't do that with an established group because uh, established groups have culture and history and they're gonna be mad at you or quit, but you can definitely like nudge them in the area of learning new charts. So the way I got around this in the Bellevue chapter is 
um, I wanted to learn like half new music for all our shows because I thought that is ridiculously fair. But you know, our older guys were like, I can't learn music that fast. So what we would do is some of the half of the new music was like a VLQ. And so like that was the really, really hard chart. And so the VLQ or something a little bit bigger uh, which would, would, would perform one of the new charts. And then the whole chorus would perform another one of the charts. And then two established quartets would perform the third new chart. And all of these charts would eventually become chorus repertoire. But it was a way to uh, integrate the chorus without freaking them out on particularly harder charts. It was just nice. The other piece about learning music, too, is as directors, you and I know that once they learn it wrong, um, it's so desperately hard to uh, undo it, to, to get it right. That's why new music is great. Uh, for those quartet singers out there, I'm a quartet singer. Uh, it's weird. When I get back with my old quartet, uh, and we sing our old songs, I suddenly sing uh, the way I used to in the 80s or the 90s or the early 2000s. And it's like, oh man, why am I doing this? I know better, but it's hard to undo that because of those neural pathways are grooved a certain way. So it's it's tough. So that's why new music is really, really cool. So I'd suggest uh, uh, letting the guys choose and say something like, all right, so we've got, this is our repertoire for Christmas, for example. Um, and I, guys, I would suggest strongly that you consider the audience, frankly, doesn't care about the level of difficulty. Um, they really don't. They, they just kind of like to hear songs uh, they know. And so I found like a lot of the music in uh, Yuletide's One is, is fantastic. And so my chorus, which would go when we decide to go to international every other year, whenever we went, you know, we, I don't know, we'd sing... 80, 81, 82, something like that. We'd be singing uh, right out of the Yuletide book, but we'd sing it beautifully. And it's it's great music. So don't discredit like easier charts because there's a lot of really good uh, uh, music in there. Uh, so that, that'd be my suggestion for music selection and, and turning over uh, music. Do the other guys out there have that same kind of problem too where the guys in the chorus are fighting uh, to keep, uh, to only sing these old songs, or are they uh, open to singing new charts? For the record, I think my issue is leadership rather than, uh, <laughs> rather than the membership. I think the members want new music, but the leadership needs to get its act together. That's a separate issue, I guess. Great. Others? I have a question for you guys. Sure, Richard. Um, last weekend, I mean last Wednesday at the at rehearsal, uh, one of the guys um, said that in order to get new members, we should introduce women to our group. And needless to say that <laughs> most guys didn't like that concept. Uh, what do you think about that idea? Because we know that mixed courses are becoming more and more popular. But what do you think about the, the concept of bringing women to bring more voices to the chorus and, you know, hope that they will bring more men after that? And, uh, you know, it's like a men's chorus singing would become a mixed. Some people don't like that, but I mean, it could be a way to to bring more more people sure uh well I, to me they're they're both kind of interesting questions and i'm i'm not sure they're related i don't think believe it or not you'll get more people by adding women i think uh in some cases you'll get less uh some of your people may uh, go you know in, in their heart uh barbershop is founded as a gendered uh uh organization and as clearly as you know with our vision statement and talking about everyone in harmony, we're, we're, we're exploring that. But our, our whole deal isn't to mandate uh, that you do barbershop the way we tell you to do barbershop. Our whole deal is, well, you should totally, we believe that there should be a place for just men to sing. All we're saying is we don't want to mandate that uh, everybody has to do it the way we describe. And so 
I'm just kind of starting a little mixed group here in Franklin, Tennessee, just to see what happens. And um, but I don't think that will get me more members. I think that will actually create some interesting problems, kind of like for those of you that have done church choirs and have men and women, it it uh, it does some uh, great things and it does some interesting things. Uh, just like Sweet Adelines will tell you when men uh, sing with them, uh, they that has some great benefits and that has some things that they don't like about that as well. So uh, there's lots of people experimenting with that. But I would say to think of women as a way to solve your tenor problem or to solve your membership problem is perhaps uh, it's probably not going to work out that way because that's that's a that's a bigger problem, right? There's something in the group that uh, is not uh, attracting new people. Perhaps you're not uh, performing where people can discover you. Perhaps you're singing music. You know, I I clinic a lot, and there's this wonderful group in uh, South Dakota, the Shrine of Democracy Chorus, and the Shrine of Democracy Chorus sings probably. 80 to 90 percent music that's patriotic and most people that uh, are strongly aligned with that uh, think it's great but they don't want to sing in it and so as they get smaller and smaller and smaller they cling to the fact that we're going to sing uh, the spoken uh, uh, national or pledge of allegiance and explains the word they do all this music that's about patriotic music and they're they're starting to realize the music itself is repelling some people and so I would suggest to to you to, to to wonder like what are we what are we doing as a group that is going to attract other other people? Now, Chad, I think you asked to be a presenter, and that'd be fine with me. Did I? I think oh, that was goodness. I think that was someone else, and they may have clicked on uh, the wrong thing in the corner. But I'm I'm chatting oh, okay. with I'm chatting with Chaz now. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. So yeah, so. Uh, Finding uh, uh, it's it's that sweet balance, right? You know, um, I'm surprised as as a music teacher. I remember thinking, "Oh my God, I gotta go to the grade school with a band again and play something from Star Wars and something from Disney." And the choir is coming. We're gonna sing some Disney tunes and we're gonna do some goofy choreography. And like, oh, the kids are gonna hate it. And of course, it's their favorite performance of the year because the high school school kids freak out because the, the grade school kids lose their mind with the joy like the music and get excited like I recognize that Star Wars song I recognize Harry Potter and they get all excited and then the kids themselves their musicians are excited because it's this great synergy with uh, the young people and as a barbershop director we forget the power of performing at the mall the power of performing at a church service the power of performing uh, at an old folks home but not just doing the things that you always do. You, you find new places to, to sing that may or may not work, work out as well, but it just kind of gets you out in the community and relevant. If all you're doing is meeting on Monday or Tuesday night in a basement of some church and never get in front of people, um, performance is important. It's like football players don't practice just to scrimmage. They practice to be in the game. And for us, that game is performing for a real live audience and moving them. And so to me, those moments are what tend to attract new people uh, far more than YouTube videos and other stuff. So just getting out of here. Did somebody have a question? So Russell, so I was gonna share, share something with Russell really quick too. Go ahead. Um, you talked about the two combined groups uh, coming together, and then you mentioned that another group is, is like within 10 minutes walking districts uh, distance, and it's kind of a interesting situation. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that? Because it sounded like that's maybe a uh, a challenge to have uh, basically three groups in that area now too. It's it, challenge might not be the right word. Um, it didn't make a lot of sense, um, even with all three groups, if you were to start at the rehearsal hall of one of them, drive to a second one, and then drive directly to the third one, you could do that in about 20 minutes. Um, but uh, at one point, there, there were 
people were feeling kind of regional in our <laughs> in our uh, municipality, I guess is, is what it's called now. But uh, you know, Halifax had a a chapter, so Dartmouth wanted to have a chapter, and then the Dartmouth chapter did really really well, and actually has won, I think, more division contests than anybody. Um, and so then this Bedford Sackville area wanted to have a, a chorus because, you know, the other two did. And, and it was almost a 20 minute drive to, to go back into town after a day's work. I mean, this was the mindset at the time. Uh, so these choruses were formed. And then when we started talking about merging, they said, oh, you know, but and they brought some of the same arguments up. That, you know, people, it, you know, they get home after work, they don't want to drive 20, 15 minutes to go out to an event. And I said, you realize, the, the director of Dartmouth lives in Sackville. The director of Sackville lives in Dartmouth. The president of Halifax lives in Dartmouth. The, you know, I'm going through all the people who live in one part that sing with another chorus. So I, all those arguments made no sense at all. Um, so we're down to, you know, we now have, I shouldn't say we're down to, we, we have two choruses now because two of them merged. Uh, they're both a decent sized chorus and um, the culture, Aren't that I used to sing with Dartmouth. I was the assistant director at Dartmouth for years uh, before I started directing in Sackville, which then merged with Halifax. Um, so the, the cultures are not all that different. Um, the level of performance is not all that different. This was always my big thing. Is I, I can see having three choruses if you wanted one to be just uh, right. this is the fellowship chorus. You know, people just show up, they sing some songs, they have have a night with their friends, they go home and that's all they want to do. That's perfectly valid if that's what you want to do. And there are some guys that that's really all they're interested in. Um, all three of us, now both of us, uh, were singing around, like you were saying before, high 50s, low 60s, you know, decent B-level chorus, low Bs, sounding okay. Really, sounding okay. Audiences like us, we're having fun, and we're not knocking ourselves out. We're doing well, but we're not knocking ourselves out. And there's a bunch of us that would really much rather be trying to sound like a chorus in the mid 70s to the high 70s and pushing things a bit. But there aren't enough of us to uh, really notice what I said us to <laughs> really uh, make that happen properly. So uh, the two choruses, as it, I mean, we get along with one another. It's not like we're fighting. Um, if we're doing a show or they're doing a show, we promote each other. You know, when it comes time to say, you know, if anybody's enjoyed this sound and would like to take part and, and become a barbershop or, or just sing with the chorus for, for a couple, see what it's like. One of us meets Monday, one of us meets Wednesdays. And we'll, you know, we'll say that. We'll let everybody know where both choruses are. And, you know, if somebody comes up after I'm performing somewhere and talks to me, it's, oh, we can't do Monday nights. No problem. Dartmouth meets Wednesday and I'll tell them where and I'll give somebody's number, you know, and they'll do the same. Um, so that that's great. That works out. But uh, I would like to see us be one really big chorus, and, or like I said, break into three choruses with three different goals. Right, that'd be fine. But so we've got two. Yeah. So Russell and Richard and uh, Dan, from what I know of you three, uh, you're you're kind of all, all a little bit with Russell on this in terms of like, you know, you're not gonna. Uh, uh, try to crush the world, but you, you, you kind of would like your groups to sing better. Uh, not to score at a contest, not to win a contest, though that's fun, but mm -hmm. there's something about singing uh, that kind of mid 70s sound uh, as a chorus singer that's frankly just a lot more gratifying. And that's the thing I really want you to focus on because as a director, uh, it's you. Um, it's not the manager, it's not the music team, it's not the board, it's not your coaches, it's not the guys in the course, it's you. You set that level. And so if you're like uh, just going to be, you can be loving, but you just have to be insistent on it. And so there's something about uh, directors that just, just don't settle, but are just relentless. So Chris Peterson is a great example of a master educator who has a very, very uh, uh, gentle touch, but he just he just demands it. Uh, and the minute that you kind of go, yes, that's it, they go, oh, okay, I guess I'm there. Um, the last school I taught at was called Curtis High School in uh, 
in University Place, Washington. It's right outside of Tacoma. And this school um, is kind of like the school that all music teachers want to want to go to and die because it is uh, a lot of the students, most of our students study privately. They call it University Place because it is in the proximity of several universities. Um, we just played uh, the, the, P, the Masters, T, PGA Masters at Chambers Bay at University Place. It's, it's kind of a, not a really wealthy place, but definitely middle class and more stable place. And when I showed up there and I walked into the band room, all the kids had tuners on their stands hooked up to their instruments. And I just about pooped my pants because I couldn't believe the level uh, musicianship, but I was like, oh, well, I guess I just have to act more like a college music teacher in my brain and be demanding, but be nice. And the kids are like, oh, okay, you just want us to play really well? I guess that's what we'll do. And so it is with barbershoppers. Uh, your guys will rise to the level that you expect them to. Um, a couple things to help you on that. And I got a little uh, chat from Eric to remind me. Um, we have, as part of our HU Online, private lessons, but we have private lessons also for uh, directors. And so if you would like private lessons in conducting, private lessons in uh, arranging, private lessons in singing, uh, we know that your guys will model what you give back. So, for example, there's a very famous uh, uh, barbershop, or excuse me, a choral leader, uh, Rodney Eikenberry, who does this wonderful uh, video, which I was actually searching for before we got on, but I can't find it, but I'll, I'll find it and I'll shoot it off to Eric to share later, where he has his chorus sing Amen about 50 times, and it's split screen. So on the left side, side we see uh, about 100 people singing Amen. Amen, you know, and it's a huge chorus. On the right side, it's him. But what he's doing is he has little notes for himself that is being shared in the writing. So the first one is, um, I stand straight, but I put tension in my hands. And so they'll sing with tension. And they sing kind of tense. And then, and remember, they're singing, Amen, cut off. Amen, cut off, like over and over again. And it says, and now I lean to the left. And the whole choir kind of slowly leans to the left. And they, they don't know that he has these secret notes. They're just singing the words amen over and over again. And they, of course, began to figure out something that's funny because he would sometimes use fists to direct and sometimes he would close his eyes. Sometimes he would look like he was deep in thought. And so the whole concept as a director, particularly the guys out there, and um, when I've seen uh, uh, particularly my my thing in tags with Richard, he's a very intense guy. And so if you have an uh, intense face when you direct, the guys will look back at you with intense face. And so it's kind of like the old joke about the choir director saying, damn it, I told you guys to smile. And uh, uh, the choir can only do what you do. They can only model back what you give them. So you have to show uh, kind of a, a strong, loving gesture for them to be safe and vulnerable to do that. Otherwise, uh, they, they, they're unable to sing. And so to get help in that, um, you can actually use our Harmony University Online tools to sign up for a lesson with either uh, Dr. Steve Scott or myself or some different people, and we'll actually work with you on your conducting technique, uh, both in person at Belmont University or uh, online virtually uh, anytime you want. So some, some tools for you, because remember, uh, guys, uh, gesture is everything. Um, so we laugh when we watch uh, some of our directors, and I assume you guys have done this, and you've watched directors of gold medal courses, and you're going, that person is a terrible director. His gesture is terrible. And a lot of times I would go, yeah, I kind of agree with you. But those people are great rehearsal te technicians, and they're able to get what they want, and then their guys can learn to almost ignore the weird tension that these directors have. Um, that's not the goal. And now our younger, newer directors, particularly a guy like Justin Miller, you'll notice that it's very fluid. It's very gentle. It's there's a there's almost no tension in his hands, in particular, high in his throat. So as the guys sing, 
they sing well, but without that tension. So just kind of think about like doing that work on you. Probably the easiest way to do that is the most painful way, uh, which is to set a video recording on you and have somebody record you on a song and then just watch it back. You don't even need the sound on, but just notice you're probably gesturing more than you mean, and you're probably showing tension more than you know, and you'll notice that you're probably looking on one side of the room more than another side of the room. So if there's a problem side and you tend to focus on the bases, you'll look at the bases a little bit too much with a little bit of stern, and so the tenors and leads and baritones will start to feel kind of ignored. Uh, so just kind of notice what you see in those videos so that you can have a much more even scan across the room. You know, music education talks about how directors, particularly instrumental directors, tend to look at men, uh, tend to look at the other boys in the room because the boys play the louder instruments, the boys play the brass and percussion, the young women usually play the woodwinds. And so it's a very different sounding band when it's a female director. And it's a very different sounding band when it's a male director with a lot of female on the brass and percussion. And it's and it's 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 shocking. It's but it's just human nature, right? So if you have a person in your chorus that you don't particularly like, it's highly likely you don't make eye contact with that person. And if there's a, a group of guys that are your friends, you'll make too much eye contact there. So that's where those videos can really help you see what you're actually doing as a director, just so you can kind of review it yourself and notice, like, oh my goodness. Um, if you watch your videos, um, I'll also bet that in moments of fear for you, you close your eyes. Uh, most directors do this on a, on a pickup that's frightening. They close their eyes, and once the group is going, they kind of reopen their eyes. It's very common. Uh, and just kind of watch and notice. Uh, it'll, it'll really, really help your people. And then probably last with that kind of evaluation, um, and I know you've heard this, but guys, if something goes wrong uh, with the chorus, whose fault is it? That'd be me. Yeah, it's the director. It's always the director. It's always the director. It's always the director. You must believe that. And there are guys that drive you nuts, but you have to know that if, if you can teach it better or you can find another way, um, for, uh, a couple of guys shared they've been to Harmony U. I used to watch um, Marty Levick. Uh, Marty Levick is from my area of the world. He's from the Evergreen District. And I remember the first couple times I saw Marty in the 90s, and I thought, this guy is some kind of wacko, uh, zen, uh, horse whisper dude. Um, what? I, I don't want this. I want, I want a music technician. So what I'd like you to notice is that Marty is very much about like, and now I'd like you to imagine that you love these people and, uh, or he does this kind of like psychoanalysis, getting the guys to look at their feelings, to think about the music in a different way. And as he was doing this, I'm thinking, what the hell does this have to do with anything? And then of course, when the guys sang, it was profoundly better. And, and I was like scratching my head the whole time, which is like, wow, what a weird, interesting way to get a beautiful result without talking about technique. So as directors, it's probable that you have a go-to technique. So if you're like a person that uh, is really touchy-feely, that's your go-to technique. If you're a person that's really like, it's about the music and the chords uh, and you're a technician, that's your go-to technique. And so what I'd like you to notice is if you only have that one uh, access point, you are communicating with only people who are like you. And that's where great teachers learn to communicate in different ways. So are you using metaphors? Are you using analogies? Are you uh, changing the environment where sometimes they stand in a different formation or they circle sing? Or now, we're, you know, my guys just about lost their mind when I had them sing um, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel in the dark, you know, with a directorless person. And they're thinking, oh, Rose, you wacky guy. And of course, by the end, guys are crying because it was so moving and so powerful. But it's just the idea of changing the environment and changing the way you direct and teach. Uh, it can really empower your guys at a new level that maybe, maybe you haven't tried before. Chad, as an assistant trying to break in, um, 
it is unlikely you can do something quite so bold, but you could definitely do something in a different way than the frontline guy does. So the frontline guy is all about like, uh, we're gonna duet, we're gonna trio, we're gonna get those octaves, we're gonna get those fifths. Don't do that technique for your time. Do something that feels differently so you're communicating with a different type of learners. So you all know about how some of us are kind of visual learners, some of us are kind of oral learners, some of us are kinesthetic learners, but if you could do something at the same time, it's much more powerful. So if you watch our warm-ups, uh, our HU uh, warm-ups online, particularly mine, but if you watch the other ones, you'll notice that the most successful warm-ups are people that are, are having the, the people do something. So if it's, even if it's just something really simple, like, and we're all gonna basically wax on, wax off, as we sing this, but we're going to move at 0 0.001 mile an hour, and we sing this passage. Now, I want you to imagine that you're moving through kind of mud and sludge, and it kind of takes a lot of effort, and there's a lot of resistance, um, just so that your people can have a kinesthetic activity as you're having them do the other thing. They'll always sing better. It's why doodling works. So when people doodle, they retain information better. We don't know why, but we just know that there's something about that physical kinesthetic uh, activity while you're listening, you learn better. So that's what you can do for your your learners back home, particularly the guys that are resistant. Um, uh, if you're in a tiny, tiny chorus that's struggling and is like near collapse, that's where bringing in uh, a quartet from across the, the way say, hey, can you do a master class with us where you show up with each section and we're going to work on, um, a, you know, a very easy song, but we're going to we're going to lock and ring chords. Um, it, it can be really, really powerful. Um, and I think uh, one of you uh, might have been involved with this in the all chapter chorus where we had, you know, it was huge, but the guys were just, you know, mostly older guys. That wasn't particularly like district champions or anything. It's just kind of regular guys. But because we had Tony DeRosa and all these people coaching and working and we only had three rehearsals, it was fantastic because the expectation was really high and unrelenting Everybody delivered, and, and you can do that too. It's hard in established groups that you didn't create the culture. So it's kind of like turning a, 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 a cruise ship, man. It takes a lot of time and energy, but once it turns, uh, you, can, you can make it the way you want. So, you know, good, good luck on that, because I've, I've, I've been there, man. Um, so Russell, you talked about your groups not really fighting with each other. That's, that's really, really cool. Um, most people I know out there who are directing a course that is in close proximity to other courses, there's there's sometimes like weird culture, weird bad blood, weird something between the groups. Do any of you have that problem with any uh, any of your members or any of your groups? Uh, like Dan, is that happening in your group at all? Oh, bummer. Thanks, Dan. I forgot. Uh, Chad, how about you? Are you having any of those issues where your guys uh, are, there's kind of some bad blood or old stuff from other courses? Um, I mean, there's, there's maybe a little bit of that. Um, I think if, if I were to, and I'm, I'm, you know, trying to be political, I think that we can do more with our culture in terms of making it a more positive culture. Right. I think sometimes we fall back on sarcasm and oh. it, it, it feels funny in the moment, but long term, I think it's had an effect on our ability to like be idealistic and make goals. Right. So, so Chad, uh, so forget the thing I told you not to forget. Remember this one. Sarcasm is death. Yeah. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest change I made at Harmony University faculty. Um, uh, I removed, oh, I don't know, probably 30 people already. And some of those 30 people are just people I'm resting. But some of those 30 people are the most brilliant people in barbershop and they're cancer. They're yeah. negative. They're cruel. They use sarcasm because it's funny. They still think hazing is cool. We cannot behave like it's the 1950s frat party and the guys love it. They don't. Now, they may be what they know, and we got to love them where they're at, brother. 
but you it's your ship man if you're if you're in charge um if you're out front you get to set the uh uh uh, uh the expectation of uh, how we're going to behave um harmony you has this funny uh a lot of I'm a district champion and a lot of district champions have this thing where you induct the district champion in and so typically uh, the new champs sing for all the assembled uh, district champion guys so it's probably 30 40 50 guys that are there and the tradition is you know what happens after you sing you know what they do oh no they're silent and then they break out in laughter or they throw things at you or do whatever so it's kind of a little hazing kind of funny thing but it's obviously with love and we know they like us but it's it's based in that that frat boy kind of hazing thing um so it was with harmony you man we, we we it was a lot of that kind of stuff and nobody did it then to be cruel it was just passed down this is how we behave but the problem is sarcasm makes it unsafe because you know something about it's mean it doesn't feel like like I love you. It feels like I'm trying to zing you, but I'm just kidding. But by but I'm saying but by saying but I'm just kidding means you don't you don't really mean that. So if if the if that's all you could work on, which is like hey we don't we don't act that way, um, that'd be great. I had a a, a alcoholic base in his 80s. My first night of directing Northwest Sound was they had just fired the director, and uh, right after International. And it was the first rehearsal back after international. And so I, I'd never directed a barbershop course and I'm directing these guys, their first rehearsal back from international. And they were mad because they were like 10th and they wanted to be high, or I don't know what it was. But uh, this guy, every time somebody near him sang something he didn't like, he would turn around and look at them and kind of scowl. And I realized, oh man, so this is cancer. This is going to kill the group. And so I waited and I said, hey, Chuck, can I talk to you? You know, and so then, hey, hey guys, let's take, let's take a quick break. Chuck, can I talk to you real quick? So I talked to him privately. I said, hey, Chuck, I notice that you keep turning, looking around at people. He says, yeah, they're saying bad notes. They suck. We got to kick them out to make ourselves better. He says, well, well, Chuck, we probably need to work on them, but you turning around and, and singling them out, uh, in a rehearsal doesn't feel really supportive. It actually feels kind of scary. And it goes, come on, they're grown man. They're not pussies. They can take this. And it's really aggressive. And I was like, Chuck, we, we, we're we singers, man. Our, our voice is us. When you dog a singer, when you make, when you hurt a singer, you hurt him. We just can't, we just can't do that. Now, when a trumpet player cracks on a note, trumpet players all push their trumpet away and look at it. And everybody laughs as they look at the trumpet. But when a singer cracks, uh, they don't look at the trumpet, they look at the singer. So it's really important, Chad, that you kind of think about like, is this a, a thing you want to uh, draw your, a line in the sand on as an assistant? Or is it like, you know, I'm just going to kind of pay my time and then maybe move on. But uh, I really want to encourage you to at least be part of that change and say, hey, man, sarcasm is, is, is a group killer. Uh, it happens all over the world and it's just not... It's not how we behave. So I'm glad that you recognize that it's not cool. So good for you, brother. Good luck on that. Yeah, thank you. And it can be hard too, Chad. If you're younger, um, I was a younger guy, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's hard. So Jay, there's been a long, slow. Yeah, yeah. Happening for Jay and others, where it, it kind of becomes that culture. Um, this is where uh, directors are more than directors, they're leaders. Um, we have to freaking own our rehearsal time or not. So for example, um, I was in big trouble because when I was a director, I didn't like it how like the president and the treasurer and the uh, district people would get off the risers to meet or kind of talk or say, it's like, what the hell? Come on. this. This is my time. This is our this is our together time. You need to do that, and I honor your time. But this is for our chorus, and so the culture I talk about is like, hey, when we get together, the, the, this is the rules of engagement. We're on the risers, and when you want to return to the risers, I'll invite you on the risers, but you don't just hop up on my risers because I'm in the middle of rehearsing, and when you walk on and off, 
we lose focus. And uh, to some people that felt like a tyrant. To other people, they kind of got, oh yeah, that's kind of being polite. But whatever it is, my expectations were clear and I gave people time to change and I kind of explained why. And it's at the end of the day, guys, I'm a director, man. This is this is how I want it to work. If you don't want this, you need somebody else. And so for the most part, people kind of got that. So my suggestion to you, particularly if you feel like you're struggling or the group is struggling, is that you think about your role in being a leader of men, being a man of good character and lifting your guys up and saying, we have to behave like brothers so that we can make something beautiful together. We're going to hold each other accountable. We're not going to be rude, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, it's going to be more fun rather than more kind of military uh, yelling in people's faces and doing that kind of stuff. Cause that, that, that never works out well. It It's not sustainable. You can do it for a night, but you can't do it for a year. Mm-hmm. So uh, anyway, cool. some, some thoughts for you guys. Um, if there's anything you'd like to reach out to me about, whether it be about Harmony University online or actually attending Harmony University Belmont, the school, or talking about uh, uh, getting some help for your directors, I'd, I'd, I'd love to chat some more. Um, you're really blessed to have uh, Eric there with you. He's a great guy, and has, uh, it's been fun to get to know him and do a CDWI out there yeah. and hope to be out again. But, uh, but thanks for all your work guys. And remember the society is not built on the masters of harmony and ambassadors of harmony and vocal majority. The society is built on the courses you guys are directing. And I mean that because, you know, there's like 700 of these groups and we, you're, you're, you're the backbone, man. You're what makes it barbershop work. And so uh, thanks for being out there and loving our guys and helping them. But uh, it's a tough job, right? And that's why uh, that's why not everybody can do it. So I'm glad you're open to learn about it. It's pretty cool. Cool. Thank you, Donnie. Thanks for joining us tonight. And thank you, everybody, for uh, chiming in in the chat room. And uh, Donnie, I hope I get the, the links that you uh, showed us tonight. And I'll post them up on YouTube for everyone to check out afterwards okay. right on. thanks guys all right take care everyone take care thanks, 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 thank Eric. you bye bye